On behalf of the New York Wine and Grape Foundation, we welcome you to New York Wines and Summer Traditions with Dan Belmont. While we wait for everyone to get logged in, we would like to review a few logistical details. If you find yourself with streaming issues, please limit other internet users in your office or household. You may need to close all other open browsers, or you may also find it helpful to log out and log back in with Firefox or Chrome. We have two forms of communication for today's webinar, the chat and the Q&A section. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other attendees. Be sure to select all panelists and attendees in the drop down to field as it can default to panelists only. Additionally, we have the Q&A section. This is a way for you to ask questions of our on-screen panelists. Be sure to enter any questions for the panelists into the separate Q&A section. We will do our best to get to all of the questions at the end of the session. Today's webinar is being recorded and streamed to Facebook Live and will be available to all attendees after the webinar. To begin today's webinar, I would like to introduce Dan Belmont. Dan has spent hundreds of classroom hours thrilling guests with wine and cheese education on both sides of the Atlantic. He fell in love with wine visiting the Finger Lakes wine region in New York State and has since worked as a brand ambassador and hospitality consultant for several notable Finger Lake producers and the statewide industry and judged the New York State Wine Classic in 2019. Dan is a certified American wine expert and holds the level three certification in wine and spirits from the WSET. His decade plus of experience is the engine behind his latest work, goodwinegoodpeople.com, delivering good wine UK wide. Previously, he led the education departments of New York's famed Murray's Cheese, the largest artisan cheese retailer in the US and Bedales of Borough, a trio of London wine bars. Dan, I welcome you and we hand the mic to you. Thank you so very much. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, welcome. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I am a New York native of Long Island, uh, longtime resident of Astoria, Queens. Uh, let's go Mets. Uh, I fell in love uh, with wine in New York, um, the people, the community, my experience there has, you know, created the lens through which I see the rest of the wine world. Uh, I've been in London now for five years, and uh, as um, Rebecca said, we launched Good Wine, Good People last autumn. Uh, and new to the website is the New York State Bottle Shop. Uh, so NewYorkBottleShop.co.uk uh, is boasting the largest by the bottle offering of New York State wines in the United Kingdom, all powered by Good Wine, Good People. Uh, so the site's chock full of information uh, about the state, the regions, the wines here. And uh, once we'll be at full strength with our stock by the end of the month, I will have 18 different New York State wines available, which is super, super exciting for the UK market. Uh, but enough about me. I'm obviously thrilled to be here. Uh, we've got a really fun topic and even better company. Uh, the theme of today's tasting is summer traditions, and we hope that the session is a great introduction to the wines of New York State, its regions, its styles, its grapes, the producers, uh, and we're going to pair some simple snacks with today's wines. Uh, in short, New York wines love summer. Uh, and we'll discover why as we chat and explore the great varieties, the terroir and styles of these three uh, New York State wines and, and, and regions. Uh, so reintroducing our esteemed guests, we have the producers of the wines in today's flight. And when we pull up that screen, it hides my notes. <laughs> uh, we have Kim Marconi, winemaker for Three Brothers Wineries. Uh, she hails from the Finger Lakes, uh, where they are on Seneca. And we are tasting the 2009 Cabinet Riesling. We're pairing that with some smoked salmon. Hi, Kim. Welcome. Uh, we're also joined by Mario Maza, uh, winemaker and vigneron for uh, Maza Vineyards, uh, joining us from the Lake Erie AVA. And we're tasting the perfect rosé with some fresh goat cheese today. Hi, Mario. Come and join us. Uh, last but not least, we have Stephen Taylor from Bully Hill in the Finger Lakes on Keuka Lake, and we're tasting the 2018 Cabernet Franc 
with some barbecue pork rinds. Uh, now, we want uh, this tasting to be a conversation, not just between me, uh, myself, and the panelists, but with our guests too. So uh, please uh, pop any questions that you might have about the specific wines or otherwise into the Q&A box uh, or the chat box. We'll try and monitor both and we'll make every effort to answer them as we go along. Uh, should we uh, skip over anything, we'll make sure we catch uh, everybody's questions by the end of the session. And the first one, who certifies an American wine? I uh, received that certification from the Napa Valley Wine Academy. Uh, and it is the AWE designation. So uh, I've got it as a post nominal. So now I'm Dan Belmont Paw. Uh, that's a joke. Uh, I'm sure that you're all just dying of laughter. Uh, so finally, a big thank you to our hosts, uh, the New York Wine and Grape Foundation, New York Wines, newyorkwines.org, as well as our producers uh, for joining us today. And we also have uh, some special treats from our friends at Cabot Cheese. Uh, so we've got a great little session. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Kim Marconi, the head winemaker at Three Brothers Winery, again, based in the Finger Lakes on the northeast side of Seneca Lake. And we're kicking this flight off with the 2019 Cabinet Riesling. Uh, Kim, how are you? I'm doing well. It's a hot one here today. Yeah. Yeah, which is mostly good for the grapes, I think. Maybe not so much for me, being Irish, but it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what kind of temps are we talking about? Because I'm over here on the Iron Ireland side. <laughs> yeah, uh, it is was like 92 and felt like 100% yeah, humidity, though I'm sure that's not actually real. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've only gotten up to about uh, mid 80s here in London, so not not too bad so far. Mm -hmm. uh, what are we uh, tasting today? Why don't you tell us about yeah. it? Yeah, so we've got the 2019 uh, Cabinet Riesling, and of course we can't call it Cabinet, so uh, we tried to be a little tongue-in-cheek with our label decoration there. Uh, it is an early pick grape, low alcohol, and we really wanted to go for that high acid. Uh, you said summer, and I wanted something refreshing, and I wanted it to have a little bite, so I figured this would be a good option. So first pick Riesling, I came in at about 17 and a half bricks and uh, whole cluster pressed it. Then normal processing went for as much body build as we could with least stirring until about July. So we got about seven, eight months of least stirring post ferment um, just to kind of make sure that we didn't take all the enamel off your teeth. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my dentist is a delight. He uh, actually prescribed me a high fluoride toothpaste uh, that uh, will hopefully keep these chompers uh, going because uh, occupational hazards, right? Absolutely. <laughs> now, I have for us uh, our pairing today. We're going to do a little bit of smoked salmon. Are you a smoked salmon fan? I am. Excellent. Have you ever paired smoked salmon with this wine before? Um, I have not, but I am absolutely into it. I'm also from Long Island, so uh, I would love a bagel with some cream cheese and the salmon, but that's probably too much for 4 p.m. <laughs> so, you know, we're told that pairing has a lot of rules. I'm here to tell you today that these rules are meant to be broken, you know. Uh, most importantly, a good pairing is going to strive for balance, from strength of flavor perspective, uh, fat versus acid, tannin versus protein. Uh, complementary flavors, you know, thinking of your wine as a condiment, uh, contrasting flavors uh, like uh, sweet and salty. Uh, and so really the key theme here is balance. And, and luckily, you know, a lot of that has to do with the acid structure in the wine and being cool climate region in New York state, we've got acid for days. So uh, what kind of things do you like to pair with this wine normally, Kim? Uh, I'm definitely into the creamy cheese. I like something to kind of fill my mouth when this will clean it out is kind of the goal that I have with this wine. So um, I know you've goat cheese in another tasting, but brie, yeah. that sort of stuff would be where I would go with this one. Um, smoked salmon is interesting though. I like that fatty, meaty thought to this wine. Yeah. I absolutely encourage everybody to jump around and try each pairing suggestion with each wine. You're going to get different results with each you know, everybody's palate is different. So um, I encourage you to, you know, just play with the different elements and see what you come up with. Uh, I did just try the smoked salmon, big kind of smoky flavor, really envelops the mouth. It is rich and fatty, uh, really, really nice cut of salmon here uh, from Scotland that I have. And um, 
what was nice is the Riesling comes in and immediately the acidity just lifts that fat off your tongue. Fat is heavy, fat weighs your palate down. Um, you know, when we're talking creamy cheeses, it's difficult to speak. Our, our acid, our acidity comes in there, breaks down that fat, lifts it off your palate, clears it, gets you salivating, gets you ready for your next bite, your next sip, so on and so forth. Uh, and um, I think uh, I think we're off to a good start. I have a lingering smokiness, but I'm still getting some fruit too. And I think that's that's really what we're looking for, this kind of even pairing. Uh, Kim, we got a question from uh, my friend, Len Thompson. Uh, is this the first time you've made Riesling in this style at the winery? And I guess I'll add on to that. Was there something about um, these particular grapes or this particular plot that suggested making the wine in this style? Uh, this is the first time for Three Brothers to make a cabinet. So actually this is a pilot series label that we have. It is for us to try small lots of new thoughts, meanderings, experiments, etc. So we only did, I don't know, less than 120 cases, I think, of this. But I had made this style in the past. So I was formerly at Sheldrake and he, uh, we have something there called the Acid Head Riesling. So similar concept, couldn't stay away. Uh, like the enamel draining wines myself. So, uh, yeah. It's really nice. I mean, it has a great like citrus zesty character. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, you know, for me, we got that bagel, you got that cream cheese, you got that smoked salmon on there and a big little, you know, big squeeze of citrus um, is, is really uh, uh, quite, quite key. Again, just, you know, bringing that acidity to the dish to bring balance to your palate is really nice. Uh, I wanna open it up to everybody. Um, and so you guys can kind of chat a little bit about yourselves. This is a summer traditions uh, uh, you know, panel today. And so, you know, summer is just kind of kicking off, um, but we're already up in the 90 degree area for some of you guys. Um, tell us how the vintage is going, what's happening in the vineyards right now, and how are your three lakes different? Sure. Um, so the vineyard is shooting off. We had all of a sudden it was bud break and then I, they were touching the top wire. I'm not really sure how that happened this year, but it is amazing out there and everything looks clean so far. So it's, you know, looking like potentially a really great year. Fingers crossed with this humidity though. So. Very good. Steven, how about you? You know, we're uh, at a pretty high altitude. We're about 1,500 feet up on Tuca Lake. So I think for uh, people in Europe, that's that's 483 meters. But um, yeah, the issue is, is we tend to bud a little bit later than most people just because it is going to be a little bit cooler. So we were able to kind of survive those late frosts that we kind of saw. Um, but overall, because we're we have really good drainage and that was the site selection choice. Uh, we're still kind of suffering from uh, drought damage from last year. But overall, I think this year from what we've seen, it's it's looking great. As long as it's hot and dry, I think we'll, we're gonna have a great year. Sounds good. Mario, how about you up on Lake Erie? Things are looking good. Uh, you know, uh, we saw some variability here right along the shore, things but a little bit later. So uh, those vineyards uh, escaped, you know, any risk that we saw again from some of that cold snap in May. But uh, like Kim said, things are, are humming right along, uh, you know, through fruit set now. And uh, again, very promising. You know, we saw a little bit earlier, uh, you know, bud breaks. So Again, always optimistic at this point. Uh, a lot can uh, a lot can happen. We've seen it kind of go the other way, and we've seen things that started out terrible in the early summer and and really come through late August. So uh, you know, coming off of what I think uh, I, I imagine Kim, Kim and Stephen would consider a really great vintage in 2020, um, hoping for you know another one like that. We like when we get the back to back ones, although. Um, We'll all be humbled at some point, I'm sure, in the near future, as uh, tends to happen for us in this industry. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I'm just kind of uh, just, just monitoring the chat, too. And, you know, everyone's kind of talking about the, the sugar acid balance in the wine, Kim. And I, I agree. I mean, it definitely drinks drier than 15 grams per liter. That's, that's really cool. Yeah, the acid, the TA is um, nearly 14. So <laughs> that, that is definitely going to take away any sort of sugar. I was afraid lower than that. It, it would be un, undrinkable lemon water. I like that bit of balance that it gives. Absolutely. Um, you know, I um, have always had kind of Riesling as a through line for my career, definitely a favorite grape, definitely discovered it up in the Finger Lakes, but you know, now I'm going and working with wines of Germany and Alsace and, and um, you know, I think that, that Riesling ties incredibly well into the larger pairing conversation because of balance, right? 
and you know balancing that sugar and that acid being such a high uh, acid grape on its own, you really do need a bit of that residual sugar to unlock riper fruit characteristic, bring balance uh, to the wine, and then you know you're going to use the, the the hopefully a well balanced wine to to balance out your food too. Um, that's great. What are the what are the kind of pitfalls that that could and and touch wood we won't. Uh, um, See, that's funny. Uh, it's knock on wood, obviously, in, in the States, but you <laughs> touch wood, and I've apparently put <laughs> that one up. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, what are the kind of pitfalls? What what keeps you up at night in, in June, July, and August? That's a question for anybody. Humidity, 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 uh, just because <laughs> that just means more spraying. Uh, you know, that's kind of the big issue for us. Uh, but again, 2020 was like a a perfect year, at least in the vineyard, it was hot and dry. So that limited the amount of spraying that we needed. And, you know, especially Cap Franc, uh, it's uh, early budding, early, uh, early harvest. So it's pretty good, but uh, stuff like Cab Sob that requires like forever, it needs every growing day, you know, it can get. So that's for us, that's so important. Very good. Mario, how about you? Same, same kind of situation? Yeah, really. I, yeah. Again, that humidity and just, you know, those wedding events, because you get days it rain and it doesn't feel like it dries out for three days because it's still humid. The sun might be out, but uh, it just doesn't air out. My, my wife is from uh, Adelaide, South Australia, and she's so used to being able to hang your clothes out and they're dry within about 20 minutes in the summer here. And she's like, I have to leave it out for three days and they're still damp. They don't ever dry. So actually they probably got wetter while you hung them outside. So <laughs> Uh, it is, uh, yeah, that's probably the biggest thing. And just, you know, keeping an eye on, are we going to have some, you know, significant storms rolling through? We don't have, uh, in the Western part of New York, along Great Lakes here, along Lake Erie, we don't see some of that activity late in the season that you can see up the East coast with regards to hurricane remnants. Although we can, you know, get traces of that, you know, into harvest, which, uh, you know, it's a couple months away, but that can be a consideration and it, it can do, uh, you know, some serious damage if you're, uh, unfortunate enough, but uh, again, we're we're off to a great start, which makes it a lot easier that we're not making up for ground later in the summer. That's for sure. Kim, anything to add before we go on to our next pairing? Sure. I mean, I echo humidity always, uh, and but at least right now it's been humid with lots of sunshine, so at least there's that saving grace in our mold situation. <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah, other kind of just ideas, um, as I was just thinking for the wine, uh, I saw a coronation chicken pop up. I think that's great. I think a little curry spice would be really, really nice with the, uh, the Riesling. Uh, in terms of our Cabot cheeses, my recommendations would be their Munster or their Pepper Jack. Pepper Jack bringing a little bit of that heat, uh, which is which is nice. Um, and even though we're, we're not really perceiving a ton of that sugar, it's there. It will help balance a bit of that heat. Uh, and again, now uh, you're going to get salivating and, and ready for more. Uh, fantastic. I want to uh, move on to uh, Mario. Thank you so much, Kim. Awesome. Uh, and uh, Mario from uh, Maza uh, Chautauqua Cellars. Did I say that correctly? I'm close enough. Chautauqua. <laughs> Chautauqua. Thank you. Uh, I went to a, a high school on Long Island called Comsawag High School, uh, which is another kind of one of those Native American ones that are that are uh, quite tricky sometimes. Uh, tell us about your, your modest rosé here. I'm sorry, your, your perfect rosé here. Yeah, we wanted to set the bar, you know, relatively low with that. No, we, uh, we, we came into this um, uh, arriving at, you know, dry rosé being something that, uh, you know, 10 and 15 years ago probably wasn't uh, something I think in the U.S. that a lot of people thought of, which is unfortunate. Um, I had some great experiences overseas with some. And it was another winemaker that was working with me at the time. We said, you know what, this variety, Chambersen, for those that aren't familiar with it, it's a, right. it's a, a hybrid, uh, French American hybrid variety. It, uh, you know, has great color, great fruit, but ripens extremely late. So it's very challenging in some vintages to actually bring to ripeness for red wine making, uh, lighter in tannins. But we said, you know what, this has some great characteristics. We experimented with it from a rosé perspective and found that it just has so much wonderful acidity, um, makes it a little bit easier on the grower uh, perspective in terms of bringing it in for this. Um, so we've found that it's been uh, something we've been dabbling with for a number of years now. And uh, again, gave it uh, uh, gave the branding a little bit of a makeover a couple of years ago, again, just being you know over, overly modest there. So um, it's 100% uh, rosé. Uh, again, uh, pressed. So key for us is we're working with about eight or nine different vineyards um, that contribute to this wine. 
and getting that fruit in picked quickly into the winery, pressed quickly and gently and controlling that color and acidity for our cuts, um, separating those hard pressings out so they don't make it in. Um, residual in this is all natural. It's about four grams per liter. Um, so just uh, arrested right at the tail end of ferment, a little over eight grams per liter uh, titratable acidity. And uh, again, just bright, those red fruit characteristics. We've just found that it's, uh, it's a great rose wine that makes uh, actually a variety that's you know affordable, very easy for growers to make uh, and really suits quite well. So we're excited about it. Awesome. Uh, and it's delicious. Um, really uh, lovely kind of soft red fruit on the nose, um, which which carries through onto the, the palate, especially in the mid palate, really opens up, unlocks some of the riper fruit characteristics, and then um, really nice acidity. Um, you and I tasted this wine on uh, the uh, European call a couple weeks ago, uh, and we switched it for this one. Um, last time I paired that with the smoked salmon, which worked very well. So I encourage you guys again, to, uh, jump around and try the different pairings. Uh, but today we want to try it with some goat cheese. Uh, and so I made some recommendations in terms of cheeses. I went to my cheesemonger uh, local here, uh, and it's called Funky Cellars. Great. Um, and I just wanted uh, a nice young goat cheese, mold ripened, uh, that um, looked really good today. And so I chose a, a cheese called St. Mar. And I took my lights. So basically, this is the end of the log. The whole cheese is probably about that long. And if you can kind of see in the middle there, light is really terrible. Oh, there you go. So right in the center there, that's a piece of straw that they actually stick through the log of the cheese uh, so that it doesn't break. When the cheese is in its younger stages, it hasn't, um, it's still a bit dry and crumbly. And so that piece of straw throughout will actually keep it uh, uh, holding its shape there. Uh, we've got some mold on the outside here, that really lovely kind of wrinkly uh, uh, mold there. It's my favorite mold. It's called Geotrichum candidum. I like to spend a ton of time on molds, but I like to throw one out early on so that you guys know that I know what I'm talking about. Good. Uh, but yeah, favorite mold here. And uh, a bit of ash on the outside too. It's giving it that kind of gray uh, mottled texture there. Uh, and this cheese hails uh, from the Loire region in France. Uh, so I'm going to give it a try. Um, Mario, um, why don't you tell us, what, what are you guys doing in your tasting room this summer? Anything exciting? Yeah, so, uh, it, well, it's nice to be returning to, I guess, uh, probably for everyone, a little bit more degree of uh, normalcy. So you've got to see, uh, actually, the patio, open space out back, so really advantageous. Um, our, our location, actually, is a combination winery, brewery, distillery. Uh, we were gluttons for punish in the, in the first in New York to do that uh, back at, a, quite a, well, feels like quite a few years ago anyways. Um, but, yeah, we've uh, ramped back up with, uh, you know, events, patio yoga, music, uh, various bits of entertainment. So we're really excited to be back. We've taken the past year to, you know, refresh and reimagine some of our tasting experiences, flights, and uh, some of our offerings and our staff training. And I think that's really provided a really uh, safe and enjoyable customer experience. And I think a lot of that is just going to lend itself to a, a better experience all around. And I don't know about Kim and Steven, but I think a lot of folks that I've talked to in the industry have taken that as kind of a, a silver lining to say, yeah, let's have, let's figure out how we can make things better. Um, and maybe we needed a little bit of a, you know, of an excuse to uh, update uh, our approach uh, and improve things for, for our, you know, our customers and our consumers. Absolutely. Kim, Steven, anything, anything to add? Any questions for, uh, for Mario? Uh, honestly, like, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so three brothers, we, they revamped some taste rooms, took the time to add additional outdoor seating. Everything's seated now. And I think that's the model that we're gonna continue. So it's not just mayhem. You get a little more personal interaction, uh, a little more chat time with the wine. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, almost reservation status. It's not quite that, but makes it a lot easier with the flow of traffic. I was going to say, Kim, we've done the same thing. And I think we have a lot happier staff for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And that makes a huge difference to the, the, the guest experience, really. Absolutely. Um, yeah. My first several trips up to the Finger Lakes were uh, specifically in the winter months, just for it to be quieter, for a little bit more personal attention. This was prior to even being kind of in the trade. Uh, and so just, um, you know, for me, a quiet tasting room is a happy tasting room uh, where you get to focus on the wines. And so I think that's a, a great move. I think it's a smart pivot. I think um, we're seeing a lot of uh, restaurants also kind of operate this way, too. 
um, uh, more more so than a normal reservation system, I think, uh, think kind of like Alinea out in uh, Chicago, stuff like that. Uh, and so that's awesome. Uh, I loved the pairing with the goat cheese, uh, really. Um, I got a very, um, it was a very rich cheese. I'm glad I didn't try and, and speak to you all while I was chewing, thank you. Um, because um, that fat really does weigh you down. It's got a beautiful cream line on the cheese. It's quite quite gooey along the outside there. Um, and uh, and very kind of mineral driven too, which, which plays uh, really well with the fruit notes in the wine. Ultimately you end up with something kind of reminiscent of tangy strawberries and cream. Um, maybe even more like like a like a, like a lactic kind of Greek yogurty acidity kind of um, with uh, some kind of nice wild strawberries, which was which was really good. You know, it should be noted that everyone's you know palate is different. I said it, I said it quickly earlier, but you know the, the parts of your brain that process flavor are closely related to the parts of your brain that manage memory and emotion. It's literally, what makes you you. Uh, and so, you know, when you are tasting things, just put the letter Y at the end of the word, nod your head, say it with conviction. Barnyardy, yeah. yeah. And then usually everybody else goes, "Oh yeah, barnyardy, yeah, yeah." You know, tasting is both subjective and objective, so it's really fun uh, to taste together in a group. Uh, friendly reminder, folks: if you have any questions for us, the Q and A box is there. Don't worry, Phil. I did not forget about you. We're coming up to our red wine next. Uh, and uh, yeah, Mario, any um, any last thoughts before we uh, we truck along? I don't think so right now. So. Great. Yeah, we got, we have Can I just time. say, I, I love this Chamberson. Like, I think that there's, a, it's very hard because hybrids have always kind of had like, a, you know, the stigma about it. But I think a lot of it is just knowing how to work with them because they do work different than vinifera. And, you know, the nose on this is incredible. So I think like you gave Chamberson, we, we make a lot of Chamberson. It's a blending grape for us. And I think you really did it justice here. Thank, thank you. And we, we kind of took the name out of the rosé because I think sometimes it gets that, that bad rap. So again, Dan, we, we set the bar very modestly. It's what the expectation was for the wine. Wait, I want to know what's, what's the, um, the, the uh, unicorn? I just, it's probably the first time I noticed that that is a unicorn. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 is a, it is a unicorn for everybody's got the bottle there, you know, uh, die cut label. It has a few sister wines as well, all mythical creatures. So um, awesome. Very good. Uh, all right, we're gonna go over to wine number three with Mr. Stephen Taylor from Bully Hill and we have our Cabernet Franc. So I'm gonna put you on the spot, Steve, and Phil wants to know, you know, reds are typically seen as ideal for cooler weather. What New York wines would you recommend for summer? And uh, I think you recommend this one. Yeah, no, I mean, well, I think all New York State Reds are, you know, they're, they're pretty acceptable for summer just because they're going to be lighter body, uh, lower alcohol. Um, and, you know, for me, especially, like, I think that this Cap Franc is very flexible and just Cap Franc in general for the Finger Lakes. So, uh, one, I'm very excited for this Chicharrones uh, pairing, but I think in terms of, like, it goes well with game, um, you know, this is something that even deals because of, like, sometimes you get, like, a, a vegetal note on a cap song from the metoxy pyrazine like yep. i would this is a crazy pairing but i like it with like a jalapeno popper or even like a mozzarella stick you know I, if yeah. we're gonna go all guy fury here but uh like uh, i really think that it's a very flexible wine and it fits uh the finger looks perfectly for that yep I, it's, it's so, I'm so glad you said, you said jalapenos. That makes me happy because yes. I love, I love pairing Cab Franc with, with, you know, peppers, bell peppers, mm -hmm. uh, and, and particularly chipotle spice, uh, yeah. that little bit of smoke in there, I think goes incredibly well. And it's, uh, it's often overlooked. You can't, you can't get too spicy. Uh, but again, you know, um, when you're, when you're working with this cool climate Cab Franc, we're not talking tons of tannin, uh, especially if it's a light oak treatment. Uh, and I think, um, yeah, I think it's great. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about the wine and uh, Bully Hill? Yeah, so um, we are uh, one of the largest family-run wineries in New York State. We make about uh, 35 different kinds of wines. We only have about 90 acres on the estate, and most of that is hybrid. So we did uh, purchase these grapes from the Eastman family, which are one of our big growers. Uh, so that's Seneca Lake. So because of where we are in our altitude, that's why we stick to hybrids. They, you know, they ripen easier. Uh, we don't have to spray them as much. Um, and, you know, Seneca Lake really is, a, especially 
because of, of where they are a perfect place for red vinifera. Because you really, if you don't want to deal with methoxypyrazine every year and be selling, you know, like that, that bell pepper taste, you really want to be able to get a, a site where you have great uh, ripening. So, and 18 was a little bit of a harder year. Um, that was, a, if people remember, it was, it was cooler and more wet at the end of harvest. Um, but in terms of where we are, I think, Reds are getting just better and better every year in the Finger Lakes. Uh, I, yeah, I like, I, I mean, Cabernet Franc, it's, I think it's a great, it's a great varietal, obviously. Um, and uh, I, I struggle sometimes where wineries almost try and strip that capsicum note out of it. It almost like loses some of its, its varietal characteristic at that point for me. And it's, it's kind of a bit too nondescript. I think this is lovely. There's just a really little uh, with it in the background, uh, just enough to you know say proudly this is Cabernet Franc, uh, and just a touch of that uh, that pencil shaving too, just just a little bit of that graphite, really nice. Um, and I think uh, yeah, I think it's drinking very well. Um, but you know, to your point, when we're working with a, a cool climate here, most of the red wines are going to uh, have really really impressive acidity, and so um, when you have that 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 freshness and that acid. Um, I think they could work very well uh, for, for the summer months, just uh, generally speaking, because you could always put a little chill on them. And, and really, I would not hesitate to put this into the refrigerator for five, 10 minutes before I cracked it open. Um, it came out of my, my kind of uh, my cellar temp fridge. And I think I could even go just a touch, touch colder, especially if it was a, yeah. it was a long day, for sure. Uh, I'm going to try it with our, our chicharrones. Um, Stephen, do you guys have any, and this will this will kind of lead into to more conversation, but do you guys have any um, uh, summer traditions at the winery that you guys do as a team? Uh, what, do you, what do you guys look forward to this time of year? Uh, for us, I mean, again, because it's such a seasonal business, uh, our restaurant comes online come, come May. And, uh, you know, one thing I, uh, we were talking a little bit about how everything changed in COVID. Uh, but one of the big shifts that we saw were a lot more people coming from in-state, especially downstate. And, you know, I think having, uh, a, you know, a city that is known for their obsession with restaurants, being able to see us experiment a little bit more with the kind of offerings that we're doing uh, at the restaurant has been kind of exciting. But for us, I mean, that's the time where we get FaceTime with all of our customers. And, you know, one thing can be said, 60% of the people that come to uh, our, our winery are from Northern Pennsylvania. So you have to give a shout out. We really are kind of like Pennsylvania's wine region. Um, yeah. uh, so. We have to be Penguins fans. We have to be <laughs> Pirates fans, you know, not just Mets and Yankees. Well, you didn't say Phillies, so I'm fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, here's hi. a good one from, what's that? Oh, hello. I said hi, sorry, we've got a guest. Oh. <laughs> sorry. Uh, here's a good one for the, for the group, and uh, I think it might be, be um, maybe a, a point of contention, but Lisa was curious to know if you would call Cabernet Franc the signature red grape varietal of Upper New York State, and that's Upper New York State, quite a quite a large swath of area we're talking about there. But has Cabernet Franc gotten to a point where it's up there with Riesling in terms of in terms of a variety from a popularity from a success rate? What do you guys think? Oh man, this is probably going to break my dad's heart, but <laughs> yes, I think so. Um, yeah, I I think just in terms of where it is and. Because, you know, part of what makes it typicity is just that everyone starts doing it. And I think that one thing, like one great advantage of the Finger Lakes is that everyone is doing hybrids, natives, vinifera. But I think because everyone's kind of gotten around the Cap Franc and is figuring out ways to be able to kind of, um, you know, make it, uh, I think that it will end up being that. But again, I think there's going to be downsides to that, which is because of vintage variation, we're going to have to really be able to explain to people what that bell pepper is and, you know, why that's important. Um, you know, when I talk to a lot of people and I explain, you know, that this is like traditional Loire, most people just aren't there yet and knowing where the Loire is. So I think that that is, you know, with this being at the forefront of being the next big red, I think we're going to have to figure out how to talk about it. I, I hear you. And I also think that Cap Franc is definitely 
the grape, the red grape of the state, as it were. Um, but I do think we are getting really, really good at getting rid of the intense green pepper and bring it down to that herbal classic Cab Franc without being uh, gross, in my opinion. <laughs> and, and <laughs> right. so leaf pulling and that sort of thing. Sorry. Am I thinking that that's a ripeness issue? Uh, yes, and a, and a canopy management issue um, for sure. And we're also getting hotter every year. Yeah. So, yeah. I, you know, our, our climate change trajectory in the last five years, we've had two extremely hot vintages. That's, you know, before that, it was a much longer stretch between warm vintages with really ripe um, fruit developed reds. You know, we were seeing cab saws out of 2020 that are immensely developed, which we don't always get that. And 16 was that way. And that wasn't that long ago. So, I think that is definitely at play with Cap Franc as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, teach your own. Uh, <laughs> do you work with the, uh, the variety up in uh, Lake Erie? We do, we do at our, our, our sister operation. We do, uh, we do some Cabernet Franc. Um, so we don't do a Cabernet Franc under the Chautauqua Cellars mm -hmm. label at Mazza Vineyards, we do. And so I have, a, I have an affection for it. Uh, it does well uh, down here along Lake Erie. Um, but I think, uh, you know, to Kim point, in the right sites, right sites with the right cultural practices, the right vineyard management. And, you know, if we're honest with, with ourselves, we're, we're still in our infancy and in figuring out where those best spots are. Um, you know, I've got a grower that uh, I would have never expected, but they, um, uh, they're fourth generation, you know, a few hundred acres, mostly juice grapes. About 15 years ago, uh, they're about my age, late 30s, early 40s, started planting vinifera. And it's some of the best Riesling and Franc that I've experienced. I mean, Franc that ripens to 23, 24 plus bricks every year. It's, uh, it's just a, a magical site. Um, so when you find that, it's, it's really promising. So I, I do believe that it's, uh, it's got great potential. So, um, but uh, I saw somebody that's, you know, questioning whether we're going to go to fight to, with Virginia over that or not. I don't know. I'll leave that for someone else. To... Virginia's got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Virginia also has even, you know, we think we have bad humidity. Virginia is even worse. So that yeah. means they have to spray even more. And, you know, yeah. the, the great thing about hybrids, the great thing about uh, natives is you don't have to do that as much. So, I mean, that's always, you know, climate change is always going to be the big, the big uh, elephant in the room in terms of what our region is going to look like 10, 15 years from now. Hybrids, I mean, they, the way that Cornell University and um, the University of Minnesota are kind of um, being able to, to put new hybrids out there, like St. Croix um, and Noir A, uh, it's, it's not out of the realm of possibility that we don't even know what the varietal will be, you know? But. Yeah, this is definitely a topic that's lit up our chat box quite a bit. And I see some, some great comments coming through. And, and I think one good point uh, was definitely um, that, you know, if you look at the entirety of New York State and you, you bring in Long Island, uh, you're going to get a kind of success rate across the Cabernet Franc grape, potentially even more than the Riesling grape. Uh, which, is, which is really interesting. And <clears throat> this all goes to say that really the strength and, and I think uh, um, the strength of the state and the pitfall of many an educator is trying to pigeonhole New York State into a tidy little box. And it's, it's, it's not worth the struggle, really. Uh, I think the diversity in, in, um, is our strength, really, uh, across all the different regions and different varietals. Uh, I think that makes a, makes a big difference. Um, how do you uh, think of the uh, the pairing with the chicharron, Stephen? I loved it. I loved it. I mean, Pretty because <laughs> it's it's light, um, and there obviously is oak on this capron, and I think that that smokiness works with the smokiness of the chicharron. So I just, I think it was it was a inspired pairing. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a big fan of. We we talked about this that highbrow highbrow lowbrow. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like the perfect right. pairing is fried chicken and French fries with sparkling wine. As far as I'm concerned. So. <laughs> That's it. And you know, in terms of summer traditions, I thought the barbecue spice would be a, a nice fun addition. For me, one of my family's kind of summer traditions was always big barbecues. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and just uh, the grill goes all day. We play horseshoes and uh, and you know and cheap beer really. Uh, but I wouldn't mind uh, I wouldn't mind a bit of Cap Franc kicking about, uh, a bit of rosé and some riesling in the ice. Uh, and I think we'd have a grand old time. Uh, Kim, how about you? What do you guys do over at the winery uh, in terms of summer traditions or maybe summer traditions for your family? Um, what do you think? And how does, how does wine play? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so we are, we do a kickoff to summer 
staff party, uh, food truck and drinks, just it's the tasting room's busy season and kind of celebratory in the cellar. If we're doing things right, most of our tanks are mostly empty, fingers crossed. So that feels good. And then we end summer with a sparkling toast to kick off harvest. So that's kind of a nice um, either end of the season. Awesome. Sorry guys, I still have a bit of chicharron in the back of my throat. And it's driving me crazy. Um, but I, I stand by it as a good parent. Um, and Stephen, how about you? What are you guys doing over at, at Bully Hill? Um, well, we did talk or, about or the, the Taylor, So here's a, here's a better question. The Taylor family has a lot of history. Oh my God. Besides working and history. watching the NBA finals. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what is more American than working all summer and watching sports, right? Uh, I did think about this a lot. Um, one thing that is really cool about Hamas sport, especially is we're the cradle of naval aviation. I don't know if you know this. Uh, so because we're overlooking the lake, a huge thing is a lot of people love to come up to the winery, you know, whether it's Dr. Franks or Boyle, and like be able to see, you know, old vintage seaplanes that kind of come through. Uh, and, you know, it brings a lot of motorcyclists, um, you know, aspiring aviators uh, and, and, you know, obviously boatsmen. So lake life is a huge aspect to that. So uh, we're still a relatively young uh, wine region. And I'm hoping if, you know, we're here 30, 40 years from now, I'll give you a better answer. But as of right now, it's, it's basically drinking wine and, and, and driving motorcycles. <laughs> the most dangerous combo I can think of. Uh, I realize I've neglected to give Cabot pairings uh, for our second two wines. So I just want to jump back uh, for the Rosé. Uh, I was thinking their Munster or their Alpine. And I do believe I did see it pop up earlier. I do believe that uh, different cheeses went out. I saw some photos on, online uh, on Instagram earlier today that had some cheeses. The list I got had some other ones. So uh, I think these are our pairing suggestions, obviously. Uh, you'll be working within a lot of the same kind of cheese categories, whether you got it from Cabot or your local cheesemonger. Uh, but for the rosé, I'd be looking towards um, just more mild cheeses. Uh, their Munster uh, could be quite nice. Uh, and their, uh, they make an Alpine style, which would also be quite good. So uh, expanding from there, your Alpine style cheeses, uh, your Comte, your Gruyere, your Eventhaler, your Appenzeller, uh, those will all be quite good. I would go for younger aged versions of those cheeses as opposed to the, the older ones. Um, and you'll have a little bit more fruit and kind of, uh, uh, kind of playful herbs to play with there. Uh, and your Munster cheeses, um, you know, technically kind of working into your funky washed rind styles. And I think that the, um, the Mazas got the structure to work with some of those, those kind of funky flavors for sure. And then for our red, I would definitely be looking to our cheddars uh, particularly your, your New York vintage uh, would be, be quite nice. Yeah. Uh, favorite summer uh, food and wine pairings that we have not discussed yet today. Who wants to jump in? Give me all the rosé and pulled pork. Well, sorry, Kim, go ahead. Well, all the rosé with pulled pork. It's a fun combination of things. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, and again, we're, you know, we're talking fat, we're talking acid. Uh, we're talking balance. Uh, I think that pork has that just pork fat. I mean, even that, that chicharron I had, it was almost sweet, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's just uh, just so much fun to play with from a pairing perspective. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a big, big pork fan for sure. Uh, what about you guys? I'm, I'm looking forward to, I'm going to take this bottle home. Well, we'll call all these bottles home to my wife because uh, we've got some, uh, you know, bone in chicken thighs, skin on, uh, crispy on the barbecue. I, I love a little bit of that crispy chicken skin. So um, figure out what, uh, what, what spice we want to overlay, but that is definitely going to be uh, on the, on the menu. So yeah, rosé, I'm Kim, like you, I'm a big fan of rosé in the summer uh, paired with another glass of rosé. <laughs> Yeah, there's really nothing better than a bit of char on, on anything, on, on vegetables. Just that grilled char just brings back so many good memories of summer. Uh, it's, um, it's exciting that we're, that we're, I mean, here in London, just about into summer, just about there. <laughs> it's, it's raining right now. Uh, Stephen, how about you? Any other suggestions for us? Well, I mean, I, I already gave away my best one, which was fried chicken and sparkling wine. But I mean, if you had, if I had to audible, I would say you could do fried chicken with sherry, which is deeply underrated. Um, 
I also really love, I, I keep saying fried chicken, but spicy fried chicken and sweet Riesling is an incredible pairing. Yeah. And you can do like that. A, like also. Korean, Korean hot fried yes. chicken. Yes. Really yeah. We, cool. we have a lot of Korean food in my, in my household. So uh, that and sweet diverse demeanors are, are really perfect. So, and the chiges are some of the hardest, the Korean stews are some of the hardest things to pair with. Um, but yeah, I think like, like usually a semi-sweet and even a rosé would work, so. Very good. We're also uh, missing a whole section of things like oysters and things on the I half know, shell, yes. which is I want everything to do with acid, bubbly or mm -hmm. Riesling, something like that. Uh, skip the lemon, go for something with high acid instead. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, Lisa said, how about crisp, uh, dry, bright white wines for salads uh, for summer? And I mean, honestly, the, the produce is, is, is amazing during the summer. Why would you not want to take advantage of it? Um, and, uh, what kind of, um, for, for our vegetarians, I do realize we've probably been very, very meat centric you know. suggestions this evening. Uh, so any kind of, uh, uh, vegetarian pairing suggestions, uh, with maybe some, some white wines that you guys also produce. Sure. Uh, we do stuffed zucchini blossoms and those are, uh, delicious with, I mean, again, touting the Riesling, but delicious with Riesling, uh, delicious with, we have, um, a dry Valvin, that's really fun to put with that. So that sort of stuff for me. Just, just to, is just on my mind. Did you guys know anybody in New York state making sherry style wines? The, the only one I know of is, is Kelby Russell at Red Newt has been playing with sherry styles for probably the last, since he got there. Uh, Len just said Fox Run is yeah. doing something, anybody else? Hunt Country does a sherry, I believe, as well as Hazlitt, I believe, has a sherry. Um, so those would be the two I would recommend. Very good. Awesome. Hazlitt's is really good. That's awesome. You know, and this is really also, exciting. we have to give a, oh, <laughs> I want to give a shout out to Natives too, because I think that like a Please. sweet Concord, uh, you know, works wonders with uh, dessert. Like, like a, especially, you know, one that's kind of has a little bit of oak aging to it um, is going to work almost like a light port because it's not going to have that alcohol, um, but it's still going to have that sweetness level. So like, I think that vanilla ice cream and like a sweet Concord is, it's really good. That might be a New York palate thing, but. <laughs> Trying to explain the, the hybrid or even just kind of the Concord uh, flavor profile to uh, Europeans proves a bit tricky, I've learned. Uh, and it's so funny, you know, growing up just doing grape juice, you know, it's for me, it's, it makes a ton of sense. Uh, but it's, it's so interesting that to just have different palates again, you know, having not tasted it, you're, you're never going to kind of wrap your head around it. You know, um, I've been in a tasting room in New Zealand and the guy next to me says he smells gooseberry, but I don't know what a gooseberry smells or tastes like. I didn't grow up eating it, but, but he did, you know, obviously there was no gooseberries in the Sauvignon Blanc, but our brain is connecting it to these memories that we have of things that we're familiar with. And for me, you know, it was a ruby red grapefruit, but for him, it was his, his grandmother's gooseberry tart, you know, and <laughs> so much more goes into it. And, you know, I think it's, it's really nice that we can have the time to, or this opportunity to talk about family and traditions and things like that, because your emotions have a ton to do with it too. You know, if he has this very fond memory of, of his grandmother giving him his first gooseberry tart and patting him on his little, cherub like head you might have a very fond connection with that wine but you know if if you know you you taste the the cabernet franc and you get uncle johnny's cigar box well that's great but if uncle johnny was a creeper you might not like that wine because it's associated <laughs> <laughs> with a negative memory for all those those uncle johnny's at the summer barbecues <laughs> Uh, it's awesome. Uh, I see some comments about uh, Wimbledon here for sure. Strawberries and cream. You took it, took the words right out of my mouth as we were doing the goat cheese tasting. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Mexican street corn came up, which I really liked. Uh, yeah, I actually did some Mexican street corn the other day. And, and the reason I popped off camera is because I finally, after four years, got my hands on some of this. And I'm very, very excited about it. <laughs> I bought two, they're very large. Uh, and um, I think some, some really good summer seafood, like I said, oysters, just peel and eat shrimp uh, would, would be delightful. Um, I think that there's, there's really just so much to work with. Uh, and so we're doing well on time. I wanna open up again uh, to any questions, if anybody uh, 
if anybody has uh, more for our panelists. You guys got the opportunity to try the uh, the different wines. Um, any questions for each other? Anything that we that I should have said and I haven't talked about? What do you guys think? Got about mm, ten minutes to go. Mario, I want to know about when you choose to pick the Chamberson because we work with Chamberson too, and I'm curious. And this is lovely example. So, thank you. Uh, it, it's. You know, I, so I originally come from an engineering background. So this, this answer frustrates myself, but you'll appreciate it. It's you kind of through experience, you know, when, you know, sure. um, <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it's, uh, it, it's one of those that I, again, when we get close to picking the Chambersen, we'll sample the vineyards twice a week for um, chemistry, but then every three days, I'm probably out tasting blocks to assess which blocks are diverting to rosé, which blocks will hang for, red and it's you know of course never the same each year um and it's through that experience and having some instances that weren't you know that didn't land quite right mm -hmm. you know we, we we learned through trial and error um but we've had you know a few vintages in a row that we feel like we're starting to lock it in we're starting to find that more with chemistry in the lab more with harvest parameters more with you know some notes around the sensory so yeah it's uh i i, I wish i could say you know there's there's even actually a little bit because you know chamberson has a little bit of the the kind of tintara nature to it a little bit of color in the pulp yep. um so actually assessing the fruit the acidity is really important before that drops off um the flavor but actually also assessing how much it does or does not stain my fingers when mm -hmm. sampling the vineyard is is an indicator of uh, at what point we're we're going to be pulling if it's starting to stain i'm 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 I've waited too long. I've missed it for that block. Mm. So, um, yeah, because otherwise it can, you know, this is actually, I don't know, rosé, what is the right color? Lord only knows. Um, but this, this skews a little past pale. And so it's really easy to have Chambersen go way too dark and you can't even get 40 or 50% of the cut to be light enough. This, you know, we're probably at about a 70 to 75% free run cut, 25 to 30% going to pressings fraction. So it's a feasible yield from, you know, um, I always joke, I wasn't smart enough to make wine with money, I have to, or, you know, with money, I have to make it for money. So um, we have to try to get it right economically too. So um, that's, yeah. So those are, I guess, some of the things that we've taken away um, it's probably about 10 years into this, this Chamberson Rosé project, which started out as a, as a, a smaller project. And uh, I'm, I'm excited, like to say, is grow. Dan knows my, my, um, my I guess, great Rosé experience that kind of turned me on to the idea was when I lived and worked in, in uh, the Barossa was uh, Turkey Flat. They were down the road from where I was working, and uh, I really enjoyed their Grenache Rosé and, and came back to the States, you know, early 2000s and realized there just weren't a lot by rosés or at least not that were accessible or as widely accepted so um something that kind of stuck in my mind is like man this is a great summer summer drink mm -hmm. absolutely uh shall we just go around give you guys any uh, one more opportunity for closing thoughts shameless plugs how about you Stephen? what's going on uh honestly just come visit the finger lakes i mean i know it's been it's been a hard year um uh, last year for everyone, but the important thing for us was matter to all of our staff and, and we were safe. Um, and it seems right now that, you know, with everything coming online, uh, a lot of people are doing different things and we have a lot of from the 2020 vintage that we want to share with you. So we hope that uh, everyone is able to make it sooner rather than later. I, I think that's awesome. I mean, I've done uh, several of these calls throughout the, the pandemic now and uh, I wish I was there. I wish because uh, uh, the energy comes through in these conversations and, you know, personally being someone who had a good thing going until the pandemic hit and then had to had to make a pivot. Um, I do. I do feel that I'm, I'm on better on this side of it all. Um, but uh, I think it's just a really exciting time for, for hospitality. I think that uh, we're going to continue to get some things right and, and hopefully get more things right and continue to get some things wrong. And, and I think that's, uh, that makes it a lot of fun. Uh, Kim, how about you? Any last thoughts? I mean, yeah, just come, come taste with us, experience our new experience and revisit three brothers. Paige and I have been there for three years now and really love the direction that the whole staff is on. It is not the three brothers of 10 years ago. So which, yeah, I mean, I honestly, there was, there was a big open dirt lot in between the three buildings uh, originally. And I saw the photo come up earlier. I've done quite a bit, which is really exciting. Yes. Uh, and Paige is, Paige is wonderful. Um, I, I caught her when she was over on uh, Keuka Lake 
mm -hmm. um, with the name is going to escape me, but um, we did several uh, wine and cheese pairings uh, with the winery she was at there. And, uh, and she's, she's wonderful. So I'm, I'm jealous you get to work with her. That's really cool. She's Mario, a W set three, by the way. What's that? She's, she's, she's a W set three. She's very smart. Yeah, uh, she was in. Mm -hmm. Mario? Uh, no, I think I, I think I captured it, you know, kind of in the sentiment. Thanks, Kim, for the question. Like I said, I'm glad you guys like it. I'm glad we can give Chambersen, a, you know, continue to work to give some of those varieties a better name, so. That's great. Guys, thank you so much. It was my absolute pleasure to lead today's class. Uh, I hope that you guys hopefully found a new favorite wine, uh, at the very least delicious pairing inspiration for summer 2021. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm hungry and I've already had dinner. Uh, so tricky position to be in. Uh, if anyone has any additional questions that you'd like to ask offline of any of the producers or myself or uh, Wines of New York, please don't hesitate to connect through the team at the New York State Wine and Grape Foundation. You can follow all the producers and New York State Wine on social media. You can find me on Instagram at dbcheesynyc and Good Wine X Good People. Uh, Thank you guys so much uh, for joining me. I really appreciate the chat. I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful summer 2021 and uh, have a great rest of the week. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending. And of course, a big thank you to Dan, Kim, Mario, and Stephen for a terrific session. I agree. I'm, I'm quite hungry and, of course, thirsty myself at this point. Um, as a reminder, we hope you will join us for our next upcoming event in this series, uh, which will be on Thursday, July 15th at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern with a journey into the vineyards. Uh, thank you again to everyone and have a great evening. Good.